Hi, all. These are generally conversations between adults after the children have left the table. The language can be spicy, and the subjects can get saucy. So if you're ready, this is the Southern Fork. Unscripted kitchen chats and also studio chats with some of the most interesting voices in the culinary South. I'm Stephanie Burt, a food and beverage writer who travels with her fork to write for a variety of publications, from magazines you might have on your coffee table to the website you love to visit for your favorite recipes. And I'm inviting you to come behind the scenes with me to get to know the people who make this Southern culinary landscape so special. I'm always hungry for the next bite thirsty for that next sip, and ready for the next conversation. Let's dig in. The Southern Fork is proud to say that once again, the presenting sponsor for Season 8 is Townsend Automotive in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. First off, thanks to so many of you listeners out there who not only decided to purchase a vehicle from this family-owned business in the last two years, but also shared with them that it was directly because of their support of this show. That's what community even in our virtual format, is all about. Second, Townsend Automotive, celebrating 49 years serving West Alabama, has been extending its reach so that you don't even have to be in the Tuscaloosa area to purchase a car from them. Nationwide vehicle delivery service is available for Southern Fork listeners, and it's something that makes buying just the right new or certified pre-owned vehicle even easier. Visit TownsendHonda.com for current inventory. Or, of course, if you're in West Alabama, stop in. Townsend Automotive always salutes local entrepreneurs, from restaurateurs to podcasters, and they welcome you to be part of a community that does the same. Today, I want to make sure and let you know about a podcast that's been inspiring me for years. If you don't already listen to Gravy, a production of the Southern Foodways Alliance, you really should check it out. It tells stories about the changing American South and is inspired, just like me, by the folks who grow, cook, and serve our food. It's always so well produced, and the next batch is produced by Katie Fernellis and Ishan Takor, and it's about the foods of the global South, which will begin May 17th. My work often stands on the shoulders of the Southern Foodways Alliance, an organization that I've learned from throughout my career, and Gravy is a great introduction into the kinds of work the SFA does to collect and inspire this region I love. Please give it a listen wherever you get your podcasts. Craft beer is more than just a beverage. It's a culture driver. Each brewery has its own personality that's expressed through product and place, be it a neighborhood watering hole or a concert venue or the place to play cornhole with your kids while you enjoy a pint. Resident Culture in Charlotte, North Carolina, founded in 2017 by Amanda and Philip McClam, has a modern welcoming style in beer and design and the brewery gathering spaces, and it's quickly becoming one of the hottest breweries in the country. It's already received accolades that include top 10 best new breweries in the world in 2018, one of Vine Pair's 25 best breweries in the country in 2022, and that same year, Amanda was the recipient of the Vine Pair 50 and the Charlotte Business Journal's 40 under 40. When I'm in Charlotte and walk into either location, it's evident that there's something special happening at Resident Culture, and the brewing of seriously delicious beer is just the beginning. Welcome to the Southern Fork, Amanda. 
Thank you for having me. Yes, it's wonderful to be sitting with you in this calm moment. And I've never really seen resident culture calm. We're here on a Monday morning, though, and it's coffee house before it turns to brewery more so. Although I'm sure you could get a beer, right? Yes, it's definitely uh, South End has a day haircut, if you will. Um, <laughs> and, and we love it here. A lot of our team members work out of here regularly because of the skylights and it's, it's a sunshiny, quiet, calm place. <laughs> but if you've been here on a Friday or Saturday night, not perhaps calm. a little unexpected. <laughs> yes, it is very, yeah. Cause I, I wasn't, I did not come in because I believe there was a line and I went, Whoa, I'm, I'm not, this isn't my scene. I'm too old for this tonight. <laughs> and I'm not too old for that every night. I'm not going to be that way, but I was too old for it that night. But the original location is where I've spent more time and that is in the Plaza Midwood area, right? Yes, that's right. Um, that one was, of my favorite neighborhoods yeah. in Charlotte. Yeah, it's uh in the building that my father-in-law ran his business out of. And so it's the one where uh, my husband has, was born and raised and uh, spent all of his years growing up going to and being in that neighborhood. So it's been pretty special to come yeah. back and, and do our own I thing I didn't there. know that. That's really cool. Yeah. Well, that's a great place to begin the discussion of building a culture because you're having to sh shift that historic building. Historic is anything over 10 years in Charlotte, North Carolina. Oh, it is way. definitely that. Then. <laughs> yes. Highly historic. <laughs> To build a, a culture, a business culture is one thing, but to build a beer culture is another thing because it it's about the different profiles. It's everything from can art to special events to what food you have to vibe, all kinds of things. And when it comes to building a brewery culture that people can feel like they connect to every time they have a beer. The cool part about the food and beverage industry as a whole, I think, is just everybody has to eat and people love to get together. So being able to be a place that gives people those memories or that they can congregate and maybe not have to clean up their house before they have people over to celebrate. It's a really special experience that I feel really fortunate to have. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we, we love getting to be there and being able to be part of the neighborhood and creating a culture that makes people feel like they can come and enjoy themselves. It's a different kind of beer culture, though, Amanda, because you're a different kind <laughs> of um, brewery founder. I understand beer culture. No one seems – it's modern. It's edgy. There's a lot of neon here. There's a lot less tie-dye, a lot less um, – Tifas? Aren't those the brand of shoe that they wear with the socks? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it's just a lot less crunchy. It's, it's, it's got, how would you explain it? I, I want to, uh, cheat and have some shorthand for when I write about it one day. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can help you out with that. So our, tagline, if you will, is where your weird is welcome. And I think that's really where it starts and ends is we are a place that celebrates people being able to come in and be their authentic selves. And that is something that we take really seriously. So it is deeply cultural in the sense that we want people to feel comfortable being who they actually are when they come into our space. Mm -hmm. And that can be a a little bit of being the funky oddball ones, if you will, so that anybody can walk in and be like, oh, okay, got it. Like, I can let my hair down here. But it's also kind of skater culture, too, right? Am I right in getting that? I mean, I think people would not be shocked to know, my listeners, that I wasn't really hip to the skater culture growing up. Yeah, I think the... The Charlotte scene for skating and DIY is definitely hugely strong and, and part of a culture where we, we just saw Eastland Mall, which had an amazing DIY skate park come down. Um, it, it definitely is something that we love and adore and that community is really special to us. There's a group called CLT Free Skate that does street skating and we 
love them too and have done some things with them as well. I think it's, it is that creative self expression for the yeah, community that, vitality, that we love. Right? Yeah. That vitality, that modern, you know, thing that Charlotte is doing so well now with the light rail and all the new construction. I mean, it's, it, I haven't lived here in 25 years and it's pretty, well, 20 ish years and it's not the same place I left. And I wouldn't hope that a living, breathing city would be exactly the same, but this is, I don't know where I am right now. <laughs> and I used to work at Jack Straws when yeah. Jump Little Children and, um, the, was it Derek Trucks? I served Derek Trucks when he was 16, oh. you know, so I was all up over here. Not far away. And I'm like, I need Siri. Siri, I need you to find resident culture for me. Yes, where I don't, am I? <laughs> I don't understand that. But that modernism, that modern feel and that vibrancy, it's an electricity through your brand and through your spaces. Even now as it's calm and beautiful and skylight, there's a lot of uh, stimulation. There's bright colors. There's beautiful different areas to be in. I'd love to take the example of the mascot that we pointed out. It's a, a skeleton, um, very day of the dead on top of a motorcycle. It's a mobile, huge in the center. People can go to the southernfork.com to see an image of this so that if they not sure what I'm speaking about, and it has a lightning bolt through its head. So Let's take that idea. What does that mean to you? And then let's talk about how you translated that into flavor. Yeah. So that's a great question. That is a character off of our flagship beer, Lightning Drops. And it's something that our team as a whole worked on for a very long time before we released it. And it's become an iconic part of our brand. It is an electric moment truly where you're being struck by lightning and he or she, they, I, I don't really believe that a, a Skeletor figure riding a motorcycle maybe has a gender at all, but um, <laughs> this former person, this skeleton uh, is larger than life and um, is truly living on the edge. And that is something where, it was bold. It was outside of the box. And that is exactly what we had worked really hard to make our flagship be both in flavor, but also in terms of the art and imagery. So it's a black can, which we're really well known for as a signature black right. metal aluminum can. can. Aluminum can right. Correct. And then these really bold reds and yellows. For us, it was signifying almost like a, a warning sign or stop stop you dead in your tracks. And that's what we wanted to do flavor-wise too with it. Our head brewer came to us from Russian River Brewing, mm -hmm. which is one of the most extraordinary brewers in my very humble opinion in the United States um, and definitely has an international following as well. And he makes ridiculously incredible beer. And so for a very long time, he was coming up with small seasonals and we weren't willing to put our name on a flagship because we wanted something that was going to stop you dead in your tracks. Mm -hmm. And we finally found lightning drops and hence hence the man struck by lightning. <laughs> or again, not not the man, but So <laughs> let's talk it specifically about the beer then. How does that stop you in your tracks translate to the beer profile. Yeah, so Lightning Drops is a is a hazy IPA, um also known as a northeast IPA, um and it is big and juicy and bold. So the hop flavors, hops are are what gives beer a lot of their flavors and this in particular has a super soft body. Um we use some O flakes there to really round out the mouthfeel of it, but it's a great one, as we like to say internally, is it feels cushiony and pillowy on. I love these on your tongue. So I love this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and then from, I'm going to use pillowy moving forward. Yes. You know what? Doesn't everybody want to feel that way when they drink a beer? I do. I'm I'm going to use it and annoy anyone who's sitting with me. I'm going to look at them and say, you know what? I wish this beer was just a little more pillowy on my yes. palate. The pillowy mouthfeel. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so it 
It really is uh, mouthfeel-wise super soft, and our brew team is incredible. They do everything from working with the water where we really start. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, you could live and die on the Mm -hmm. water that is making a beer, and so they really have perfected the quality of the water and where we start there and then moves through all of the processes to create this exceptional beer. And then the hops that go in the beer are really wonderful. Um, most notably is Citra. And that is That's as that the name says. Juicy. Yes. That's classic, that classic juicy citrus. IPA. Yeah. And uh, the color is just really, really orangey and bright and has that haze to it. So. Did I say that I didn't need a beer for this interview? That sounds like <laughs> the exact kind of juicy IPA I could go for right now. Yeah. Yeah. And and that is something that stops you dead in your tracks because number one, it's not a, a 12 ounce, it's a 20 ounce pint, right? 24 Six, ounce. 16 ounce. 16 yeah. ounce. Yes. So still it, a lot. <laughs> still, still a lot. And I, I like to think about you being so creative that you could I've interacted with you a couple times and you could have done a lot of different kind of creative businesses and I ask this a lot of brewers what about it captured what about beer captured your creative imagination so that's a great question first of all thank you for saying that that's very kind and I I love what I do and I think that it is, it is truly going back to that sense of community and the culture. It's craft beer is the only industry that I have experienced both through me personally working in di- several different industries, but also through speaking with people. It is the only industry where people peel back the curtains and allow others to see it so that you can continue to learn from oh, each right. other yeah. and grow. Mm-hmm. And it is a sense of camaraderie instead of competition. And that is truly unique. I think in it, that is, I'm speaking from an international sense. We get together at festivals and at conferences, people gladly share their resources and, oh, I, I, have this hop farmer that I'm using. Hey, would you like to come to the farm with me? I have an appointment and you're a much smaller guy. I can sell my hops to you. Or, hey, I, you know, I'm getting this really exceptional juice from this purveyor. Mm-hmm. Let me make an introduction. Mm-hmm. And that is something that is so unbelievably special to me and definitely suits my personality as well, where I believe that, you know, there's a rising tide floats all boats. Exactly. Truly. Well, and I talk about this a lot, and that really is the basis for the Southern Fork is that I believe that actually in food and beverage, when they work correctly, is a great example of a hive business model mm. instead of a Darwinian business model. Agreed. And so the best food cultures in the country are when the chefs – have friendly competition. Think about anything in a creative art. You you have the Algonquin circle when it comes to writers, right? And you need yes. something. You need to play off of each other, but you also need to inspire each other and compare notes. And in case of products like beer, share suppliers. That's and it helps everybody because that that hops farmer now has two accounts instead of one, which protects the person who told you about that. Yes. Well, and I think especially a city like Charlotte that has so much potential and already is doing such an exceptional job of continuing to evolve. I think truly, to your point earlier, being here 20 years ago, I moved here nine years ago It is a completely different place than it once was. And if we all continue to push each other towards bigger things and and refining what we have and playing on a more national and global scale, we're doing ourselves all a favor. We're already seeing so many people start to come and visit Charlotte. I just remember, well, recently there was an article that came out about Charlotte becoming a bachelor bachelorette destination. Please take some off of the other places I visit. Can you just funnel, just funnel a side creek of them? 
Yes. So they're not all well, glommed in one place. No, <laughs> sorry, no y'all. We get, it. we get yeah. it. We get it. We get it. No comments on the on the pros or the cons of that, but I think that that is a a huge indicator yes. on it becoming a city that is now on people's radar. Whereas before, of no disrespect whatsoever to Charlotte, it's the place that I chose to move to nine years ago and call home forever, but. Leaving New York City and telling people where I was moving, not everybody knew where I was going to. And I still get, not as often, but I used to get very frequent calls about, oh, I'm going to be down there. And if they said, I'm coming for a wedding, I would say, no, you're not. You're going to Charleston. And then they would look it up and they were going to Charleston. Or they would uh be going to some kind of event and it was Charlottesville, Virginia. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it, yeah. it is I grew up come. in Charlotte. I know the feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I didn't have to say North Carolina at the end. Right. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, you know where Charlotte is. I think also too, though, it doesn't, it doesn't just refine. It's more fun, right? It's yes. more fun to work this way. And I'm going to bring up this next point because you do, but I hesitate sometimes to bring up challenges based on gender, race, identity, because I'm meeting you about food and I don't, or I don't think that label is the focus. I do care about aspects, but I don't think that label is the focus. And however, as a female brewery operator, um, brand owner, beer brand owner, founder, you're still dealing with the idea of a male-dominated industry, correct? Yes, definitely. I, I w- well, first of all, I think it, it food and beverage is actually a position that is completely centered around those things because food and beverage are culture and culture and gathering and tradition and history, and so it's deeply entrenched in all of those things and you can't separate it. You can't really separate it. Well, and I think that's what I'm trying to say in a very weird way. Like I just want to meet you and all of those aspects are you, but I don't like leading like I'm going to speak to a female brewer today. Yes, understood. Because that's a conversation that people can go yes, no, instead of I want you to meet Amanda today. Right, right. That's a difference, right? It's a huge difference. And I think that what it leads to ultimately is that the more women and people of color that are in the industry and in positions of leadership, ownership is awesome if Mm -hmm. if that's an opportunity. However, the more of them that there are, the less there's a need to have the conversation. But until there is, it's important so that a person – that dreams of that knows that that is a possibility for them. But you can't, if you can't see it, you can't do it. Right. I know that. Yes. And I think that it's also, if, if you are somebody who walks into a room and recognizes that you're the only person of your identity in that space Mm -hmm. for any conversations, you're very aware of that I'm going to call it the sense of otherness where it feels bizarre to you. And maybe you don't stand out to other people, but to you, you're very aware of the fact that one of these things is not like the other. I I still remember that. It's a physiological reaction as a human. Yes, very much so. So the more people that we have of all different kinds of backgrounds standing in that room, or sitting at the table, whatever you'd like to, to call it. It doesn't matter. We, we use all the puns, yeah. all the all the references. The more it feels comfortable to take a seat, knowing that there's no one outlier. It's just a lot of a lot of different people all sitting around. Um, I remember I walked into my very first craft beer festival. I was in Richmond, Virginia, um, and went to a beer fest and walked into the brewer's lounge. I had just had my first baby. It was the first one that I had been on the road because I had a under one year old in my house that was still very much dependent on me. So I felt very out of my element for a lot of reasons and just physically uncomfortable because I I had a, a small baby at home. But I remember the relief that washed over me 
seeing another woman who is still one of my dear friends to this day uh, and having her walk over to me and show me around and say, oh, hey, you know, have you met this person yet? Okay, come here. Come meet this person. And knowing that all of a sudden I I was included. Yes, that I I was I was welcome. Mm-hmm. I was going to say safe, but I didn't necessarily feel unsafe. It just was. I felt like you were. I was. Yeah. O- I was okay to be there. Um, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. And of course I was because I was representing my own brewery, pouring with a lot of other people that also had breweries or worked for breweries. So of course I should be there. But it was my first. That first time is so pivotal in making sure that you feel welcome or that anybody feels welcome. So, Well, and I appreciate you sharing that moment because I think we all think that nobody else has imposter syndrome. Right, right. But there's always a reason to decide to be the other, right? In our minds. Yes. And sometimes it's just where we are. We can't help it. So before we get to those final questions, I want to ask you, we talk a lot about the challenges. What about being a cis woman is a strength for resident culture? I definitely feel that way. I think the opportunity to be in my position has allowed for a lot of my teammates to feel like they can speak their minds more clearly, that they are able to have upward mobility it's again seeing lived examples gives permission in places where it might feel a little bit uncomfortable and so knowing that we're approaching our business and our practices with that thoughtfulness is i think in a lot of ways really liberating for all of us working together we have a lot of different people that are in leadership positions or who have been promoted throughout working at the company now that we're five and a half years old. And it's been really fun to see what a craft beer world looks like when you have a lot of women and non-binary people that are in positions of leadership. Yeah. And lots of times I know that in my life, I didn't understand placemaking. When people started using that term or they started saying permission or inspiring, you know, I didn't under understand that because I come from a place of privilege, you know, and I was tucked on into my comfort zone, you know, and I didn't notice that. I had no idea. But it I've realized as I've moved as a creative person and wanted to push my own boundaries or interested in exploring that. I didn't even know that I was looking for permission. And so it's like in a generation or two, it'll just be normal, right? But you don't even know what you don't know. Yeah. Like you don't even know what you're not seeing until you see something different. And you're like, whoa, oh, you know, I think that's what our culture in general is going through. But what I love about resident culture is that moment of transition of change is joyful. Yeah, it's a lightning strike, but it's joyful. Come on in. Let's have some tacos. Let's have a beer. Let's hang together. My name is Amanda. I mean, that's a joyful place to be. We're not having roundtable discussions. We're talking about Citra. That's that's a lot more relaxing in a way, right? But Love it's that, still yeah. as powerful. And I think it's it's a lot of fun. So... You've got two places open. Um, this is not cheap real estate down on in here. Nowhere is cheap anymore. No, and certainly Lads not in Charlotte, it. but South End for sure. <laughs> South End is up, up, up there. So what is making you hungry? I mean, you've made some really big, aggressive business moves in five and a half years. So what's next? That's a great question. It's it's one we we talk about often and I – I know the answer and that is essentially we are we're really striving to take what we have and make it better. Mm-hmm. I think at this point we didn't know what South End would look like coming out of the lockdown years and no business did but certainly not a bar and restaurant uh brewery business at all and so that's been something that we really have taken a look at these 
hundred team members that we now have and a brewery production facility that has grown immensely and are looking at how do we take what we have and improve it substantially because we've for many years, four years had the same team pretty much from the day we opened. Uh, we had 20 something folks, including the three co-founders. Right. So it was a small tight knit uh, family and it still very much carries all of that culture. But I think now we're really dialing into how we can have an even stronger offering and team base here in it as we start to have different locations and really nail down what that feels like for our team, but also for our guests coming in that are experiencing something completely different because every building and every community that we step into is a celebration of the sense of place that exists there. And that's really important to us. That is a great point. And that means that you're a Charlotte local, if you get that, because (laughs) Charlotte like any bigger city, but definitely a city based on the car instead of good transit. Yes. Even though better transit than when I was a kid is a city of neighborhoods. So this is completely different and 15 minutes away from the other location. And so it it does have different needs. The people coming in are different. And a lot of people in this area, Plaza Midwood, wherever you are in Charlotte, you stay in your hood. Yes. Because you don't want to get in the car and go 45 minutes. You're like, oh, who's playing where? Oh, wait. That means we'd have to leave at what? <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> when it comes to concerts, it's like, okay, we got a plan. So even if you want to eat across town, it's it's a whole thing. Yeah. Well, and I would argue also, too, that each neighborhood pocket has such its own personality in a beautiful way. And all of these great little restaurants and it, it truly is, it is something to stay within your own hood because you have such great choices now, which is very different than I feel like it was even 10 years ago. So that in of itself is a wild win for Charlotte. But yeah, people, you know, want their cheers situation. And <laughs> why wouldn't they if it's a great neighborhood, you know? And also from a creative standpoint, that's really fun because you you don't get bored. You're right. not replicating the same, you know, suit of playing cards here that you're doing there. You know, you've got the ideas, but you're you're mixing it up and that's really fun. Yeah. Um so what is one aspect of this job that you've created for yourself in the middle of creating a life in Charlotte, creating a family, you know, and strengthening all of those things that really meshes with a natural aspect of your personality? Is there something that just really fits like a puzzle piece? Yes, I would say the my my love of service and that is a Radical empathy is one of our core values at the company, and it is true to my core and to my soul is putting myself in other people's shoes and trying to take care of people is a very natural instinct that is very much my biggest strength and weakness. Weakness being that it can be very draining and taxing if you don't protect that side of you on some front. I'm a mom of a two-year-old and a six-year-old. I've got a partner in my life. I've got another business partner in addition to my partner in life and business. And then we've got a team of people and then also our guests. So all of those pieces are people that are very important to me and the ability to get to be part of people's lives in such a big way is such a huge honor and something that I have loved since I was a little tiny girl. I mean, you literally, my mom has stories of me at this Peking duck restaurant in New York City that we went to all the time and me just running into the kitchen and giving people high fives and wanting to stay in a kitchen with possibly some hot oil going on. (laughs) But, you know, I just, I loved to unpack the puzzle of who every person was and mm-hmm. also to make them feel really good makes me feel good. So um yeah, I think that that's, that's the biggest part about what hospitality can do and what I strive to do. And it's, it's a fun little challenge, especially with different places and, mm-hmm. and this business. It's good. I like radical empathy. 
I'm thinking about what does that mean and how could I interpret that? I mean, I've already written down that word before myself. Yeah. So it's a it's one of our beer names too, but you know, it, it really is about giving people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Most of the time. What is one thing keeping you up at night? Quick fire. Ooh. Uh one thing keeping me up at night, usually my kids. Usually my kids. Um, but I also constantly wake up. I actually was up at three o'clock this morning and it might be because I'm partially on Copenhagen time still, but more likely if I'm being honest with myself, it's me trying to tackle some of the things in the business that during a work day, I'm in the flurry of my inbox and supporting the people around me. And then at night is when I finally get to unpack things in a deeper way. And so there's a lot of Google searches, a lot of screenshots, a lot of note taking of, okay, what happens if we did this? And would this make things easier for my team, better for my team, make resident culture better? Um, so yeah, that, that innovation piece or problem solving piece is, is usually what keeps me up. But I also have a cute little two year old that loves to come in. <laughs> but that's usually problem solving too in some way right yeah yeah <laughs> well i know that that time goes quick so it's it's usually full of a lot of tiny hands and soft snuggles but oh, that's yeah sweet. yeah well i'm so thrilled that you've made time for me to come spend a little time with you today and something i reserved just for southern fork listeners is the magic picnic basket now i want to bring you some things that bring you life and when we talk about food we talk about things that we remember celebrations and uh, we remember the people that we were with. So with this basket, I can time travel. I can go back and ask somebody to make one more bite of something that you would love to have. I can source for you and I can cook a little bit, occasionally a bunt cake, maybe some pimento cheese. I mean, <clears throat> I'm pretty stereotypical Southern, um, but I do make a really good um New York Times recipe of uh, lentil um, curry, a Ooh, ginger yum. lentil curry. So there's lots of options for you, yeah. but you're not going to need my cooking. It's just some stuff that you'd like to eat today because I know you're, um, you know, food centric. So that's going to change. So what can I put in the basket for you? Oh, so something with memories and warmth and love, not necessarily hot is in temperature, but yeah, mm -hmm. I... No, right off the top of my head, probably the number one thing is a hot pot. I used to live in Beijing uh, and a solid Sichuan peppercorn tingly mouth hot pot with a Qingdao beer that weirdly kind of tastes like garlic in Beijing. I can't describe it, but it is factual to my taste buds. Uh, that would be it. it. Just because you're sitting around with friends, you're cooking your own food, but it's all coming out in waves and it's really electrifying for all of your senses. Mm -hmm. So I love that communal, spicy. And if you've not had Szechuan peppercorns before, we're talking about the kind that actually provide a buzzy feeling. Correct. Yes. On your Tingles. tongues. Tingle. So it's we're not just talking about hot, spicy, which hot pots are Warm in temperature. There are and chilies spicy. as well. Yes. 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 But the Szechuan peppercorns are like little electrodes in a way. Yes. So in the fun way, but also can be overwhelming. Yes. I think if, if you're not knowing what to expect, that tingly numbness is going to shock you. But once you started it, I would argue that it is highly addictive in the best way and it really brings, good for you. Right. And it, it bring it, it's an endorphin endorphin hit yes. just like a chili yes. right so i love that and um in the hot pot do you have a fla favorite bite in the hot pot yes there's um they take it's called bing tofu and it's it's these little uh tofu cubes that they freeze and when they freeze them the water expands so it becomes a sponge basically and when you put it in the hot pot it is this little strange sponge that soaks up all of the different flavors. And the fun part about hot pot is that it layers, right? Because it's it's the longer that you're cooking it and the more things that you put in it, the better that it tastes over time. So you start off with the meats and as you're sort of graduating through, then you put in the bing tofu and that's 
full of all of the good stuff because it's all the flavors from what has been before Mm -hmm. plus its own little piece. But um, yeah, it's, I'd never before I moved to Beijing that, that year had it before, even though that I, I grew up in a half Chinese home. So it was, it was new for me and I could not have been more excited. I probably ate my weight in, in hot pot and bing dofu that whole summer and could not get enough. But I, I keep on going back. In fact, I'm taking my parents there on a surprise this weekend to a new one in Pineville Matthews or yeah, Pineville, North Carolina. Um, and they have little robots that come to the table and serve you. Um, but they don't know about it. So it's okay. This won't air until after after I've taken them. But um <laughs> Well good. Yeah. Good. Well, you sound like a wonderful person to share a hot pot with. So if people want to learn more about Amanda McClam and resident culture in Charlotte, North Carolina, of course you can Google it, but I would prefer if you went to the southernfork.com to actually see the face behind the voice, um, click on some links and uh, read some more info about Amanda and the delicious beer and um, very particular beer, beer culture that they are creating here in Charlotte. If you like what you hear, I'm going to link some more beer content below on her dedicated episode page. So you can click around and, uh, there are more than 325 episodes in the archives. So <clears throat> you got some listening to catch up to do. <laughs> I am sure. Um, in the meantime, you know what goes great with an episode of the Southern Fork? A beer. So thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. Hello, and welcome to Talking With My Mouthful. As the temps rise, especially in the South uh, this time of year, I'm going to take this opportunity to dispel a few myths when it comes to keeping beer cold or letting it be warm or buying it warm or things like that. Um, According to many of my brewery friends, It is a myth that if you buy beer cold and let it um, warm up, it will spoil. Now, of course, if you keep it in a hot car in the south, especially um, in the sun, it's liable to explode. And that's not going to be good for your car or your your, um, imbibing. However, if it just warms to room temp and then you decide to chill it again, it is not spoiled. I believe that this um, myth might have begun because beer is a perishable product, though. And so it's a food, you know, it's it's um, a fermented beverage, but in the world of fermenting, it is um, not as fermented as um, wine. It's definitely not as shelf stable as distilled liquor. So it will last longer if it is kept cold, but there is no need to bother the um, person at the counter and ask them for a warm four pack from that stuff that you saw in the cooler or ask them to get you something from the back. Sometimes they don't have anything at the back. What they have is in a walk-in that's cooled in the back or in the cooler by the cash register or by the door. So just a heads up there, if you put some beer cans out on the counter and they warm up, then you can put them right back in the fridge and cool them down again and they will taste just fine. And in the case of resident culture, they will taste delicious. So thanks so much for listening and I will be right here with you next week. You've been listening to The Southern Fork. I can't wait to bring you more culinary conversations, but in the meantime, I have one question. Are you going to eat all that?